Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. I wasn't expecting a full room. Uh, so, um, well, thanks. My name is Lorenzo. I'm going to tell you about exactly what, what, what this says. Um, things I learned about looking at a large amount of code. Very, very large. Very large. Um, so, about me. Uh, this is my Twitter handle. If, uh, if you want to take out your phone and follow me. No, just kidding. I don't tweet much, but... Everyone adds the, the, their Twitter, so I'm doing it. Um, I've started my, so I come from a technical background. Uh, started my career in 2012 as a Salesforce developer, uh, passionate about fixing hard problems. Um, that was a time where the system, the, the ecosystem was growing like crazy. I mean, it is still now, but that, in those days, there was always a challenge at any level ready for me to be taken. And I, I learned very, very quickly. I had a lot of opportunity to challenge myself. And eventually, I started working in a, as an architect. I've been working on many high complexity CRM implementations, so strong, uh, large, global projects. Uh, I've, I've traveled the world. I come from Italy, and then I suddenly started working with Salesforce and traveled the world. It was a, a dream uh, for me. Um, I, so it, I, I gained this exposure to this incredible technology, suddenly exposure to people at very, very high level in organizations, uh, always working on transformational projects. It was a very exciting experience. I eventually became a CTA. Um, it, it, it's one of my biggest career accomplishments. It was a very tough uh, journey, but incredibly rewarding. And um, the second uh, biggest achievement is to start, was to start my own company uh, that is called Clayton, that was founded in the same year. So these are my two biggest accomplishments. Uh, and I, uh, there was some space in the, some white space in the slide. So I thought, let's put some pictures. <laughs> uh, and what is that that we do? So the reason why I'm telling about my company is because uh, what I am presenting is something that became possible by doing this. So we are a small start, a software as a service startup. We are headquartered in London. And um, what we do is we basically help comp Salesforce teams that have very complex um, implementation on the platform uh, to make sure they are secure, robust, and future-proof. And I will come to, back to that in a minute. Um, what we do is basically one of two things. We can do in-depth code assessment. So typically, we have customers saying, we have a mess. We burn a lot of money. We need to figure out what's the state of our code base. So we, 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 we do in-depth assessment of that. But we also provide data services. Uh, we can monitor development for our customers and prevent them from making mistakes. So before they introduce a vulnerability by accident or a, a bad pra coding practice, we can block them. And um, I, I, I don't want to go too much into how we do this, because of course this is not a, a kind of a pitch, but I wanted to give you a sense of why I gained this exposure in such large amount of code in my, over my career. And to give you a sense of the scale, we work with a lot of customers, and we roughly scan 200 million lines of code every day. So our, our system processes this amount of data. And to date, it's roughly 17 billion. So when I, when I so this, uh, any, has any of you read a blog post with this title? No, okay. So, okay. So it's a funny thing. It started as a blog post. And then the, the blog post gained traction. And I thought, okay, I should probably do a talk. But in the meantime, the data became more. So I'm presenting now data that is about uh, a larger volumes. So numbers are slightly different. So this is just to say we analyze a lot of code. And, and today is about sharing some of the things that I've learned that have surprised me. Uh, maybe they won't surprise you, but maybe they will. Um, so before we start, just to... Um, just to share a little bit of the intention and the, the framing of the talk, we will, so we have this uh, sampling that we did is roughly 600 uh, 
uh, orgs, implementations, projects across the, the world. And uh, the overall number of lines of code that we have processed is this. Uh, of course, it's not everything. So we will make some inferences. We will assume that this is a good enough sample to tell something about the ecosystem. Um, so it might or might not be accurate, but I believe it's, it's a pretty good uh, uh, sample. It's pretty realistically um, telling us something. Um, it say all the code is scanned confidentially. Now, this is very important. Now, I don't want you to go and, and believe that I am looking into this code and then sharing it. Uh, there are systems that do this. We process a code in an um, in encrypted way and then discard it. So everything I'm sharing is about just the metadata that we get out of it. And uh, it's, it's, it's important for me to say this. Uh, there is a good mix of ISVs, consulting partners, and users. Can I just ask you quite quickly, how many of you work in consulting? How many for end users? OK. Is the rest ISVs? Or? OK, no, OK. Um, so just a mix of these three type of actors. Um, the code, so. Something that I really, I mean, I think it's very important. I'm telling you problems that we find, right? But this is not code that is written by, you know, um, dogs, right? It's uh, written by professionals. Uh, and so the point I'm trying to make is that we are all professional. I believe most of us are. And so if we learn something out of this, I believe it, it's something that is regarding all of us. So we should. I don't know, I think do a step back and um, take this data uh, as something, something that tells us something about us. And um, yeah, it's Apex Visual Force Lightning. And don't, take, don't feel offended if I say anything that might not be so nice. So there is something that uh, um, the, the first learning is that an average Salesforce application uh, carries an average technical debt of 7.88 dollars per lines of code. Now, uh, this is an estimate. I, I, I think we are the first. Uh, I'm the first putting something like this out. There is a, um, uh, is anyone not familiar with the concept of technical debt? So everyone understand the, the word. Right, so the, the kind, uh, ju just to very quickly uh, bring everyone on the same page. The idea is that there is an implied cost of reworks when you do something quick and dirty instead of like a good thing, right? And that's OK. It's normal, and compromises are, are important. I'm not one that says we should always be all about beauty of code. You know, realistically, in the world, you need to take some trade-offs. And that's OK. However, we need to be conscious that by doing that, we, we start having a price that we will have to pay later at some point. Right? And the analogy that I always make is like, uh, um, is like moving in, uh, on the ground versus moving with your, with your legs in water. If you have technical depth, that will slow you down. You can still get from point A to point B. It's just a lot harder. Right? So this, I believe, is a, is a good analogy. At, at least it works for me. Now, what are the, com the, the, the common things that cause technical depth? Well, just to name a few, weak dummy unit tests. So if, you, if your tests are not following best practices, they, don't, they see all data they shouldn't, you're basically starting accumulating that. You're, everything works. You can still you know, deploy your functionality. Your business is happy. But your next change will be like slightly more expensive, and so on and so forth. Right? So this is the idea. So if you don't use data factories, your test classes have a new account. Right? And you have uh, 500 tests. Then someone adds a validation rule, and you have 500 tests that are broken and need to be rewritten. Right? So this is what I mean. And lack of assertion. So there are all sorts of things. And of course, we codify these things, and we check for them automatically. But I just wanted to give you uh, some idea of what I mean when I say, let's calculate. And, and the math that we, we did is pretty much about uh, uh, we count all these things. And we estimate how much it will take to fix them. And we multiply that by the cost of development, divide by the number of lines of code. And that's where that number comes from. Yeah? Um, so why do we care about this? It's, it's something that I just mentioned. 
there is a different cost to change. So as a business, if you want to, if you have some requirements you want to deliver, and you have uh, some capacity, people, money, whatever, uh, to get from point A to point B might have a different cost. And typically, the cost is a function of, well, uh, the capacity you have and the technical debt you have. So as a rule of thumb, I'd say 50% more if you have technical debt. Now, this is not about the numbers. This is just to give you a, an intuition of the concept, of the idea. So we care. why do we care about technical debt? Is that about beauty? No. It's not about that. It's about uh, the cost to change and the fact that this is detrimental to agility. So the next, if you are investing in building a complex system on the platform, uh, your velocity will go over down. It, it will go down over time, and at some point you pay this price. That's that's the point that I'm trying to make here. Um, right. So I would like you to look at this code. You're all technical. Uh, there is a class, there is a method with some code that is called real method, and then there is a fake method with a lot of I++ that are repeated over time. And then there is a test <laughs> that uh, calls the fake test, and that's it. That's my unit test. Has anyone, is anyone familiar with this thing? Has any of you seen this before? Okay, so I didn't need to run the analysis with like 10 billion lines. I could just ask a room of people. Uh, this is a trick that is used by some people to trick the code coverage requirements of Salesforce. So the basic idea being, well, yeah, I know I have to write tests for everything, but I'm lazy, so I will create a lot of like a, a very large methods that does nothing that I can test with a fake call, and that will give me a lot of coverage because this is relatively larger than the other methods. So this tricks the, this tricks the system. And uh, so you know, if you're deploying on a Friday and your coverage is 74%, uh, you might feel tempted of doing this, right? So how many, I mean, by raise of hand, do you believe that this is a common thing? Someone. Someone said uh, they've seen that before. Would you say that this is something that is uh, less than 10% 10, 10 or more of the orgs that we, we looked at? 90%. 90%. Wow. <laughs> Where do you work? <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that this is 90%. Uh, but however, it's, uh, it's a big number. In my view, it's a very large number. So the number we see is 62%. So, 62% of the orgs we analyze on a sample of roughly 600 orgs show this pattern at some point, right? So the, now, I mean, I mentioned a lot of things uh, around code quality, uh, uh, reasons for technical debt. Uh, maybe you might be interested in the top five things we find. And this is a chart. Um, problem. And uh, this is the incidence of that problem. So how frequently on all the orgs we tested, how frequently we see that. So unit tests not using data factory, it's not a big problem, but it's, it's kind of, it kills your productivity over time. And that's by far the biggest reason for uh, bad code quality. Well, uh, for accumulation of technical debt, let's put it this way. Uh, they, dummy unit tests, tests without assertion, things like that, we see them a lot. Um, unbound SQL statements is basically when you have a SQL query that has no way of being limited. There is no limit or where, where statement. So you're basically retrieving the data, hoping that your table is, is, doesn't get large enough to break governor limits, right? So it works for a while, and then it stops working. And then you have to figure out what, what happened, right? And that happens quite a lot. Uh, there are still a, still a lot of queries in loops. We, we, for some reasons, and our coded IDs are still very, very common. Um, so I don't know, is any of you uh, surprised or no, no one? So it's not going to be my talk, the, the one with the takeaways. <laughs> right, OK. Um, so there is uh, something uh, slightly different now, which is uh, about security. 
Now, um, security is uh, typically the problem that you don't know you have, but you have. That's according to our insights and our perspective. Uh, we, of, out of all the orgs we tested and the, the, the repos we tested, two out of five have potentially exploitable security problems. I'll go into the details of that in a minute. Um, that doesn't mean that, um, so not every security warning is the same. Not every security problem is the same. From an upset standpoint, there are vulnerabilities that are more dangerous than others. Uh, but the, the key thing to, to, pay, to, to keep into account is that when we are talking about a Salesforce implementation, that is typically we are dealing customer data, right? So very often we have customer data, we have communities and portals that expose to some degree this data. And Salesforce is a very secure and robust platform to do this. And there are a lot of mechanisms to do this safely. However, when you start writing code and custom functionality, you open yourself to the risk that you might introduce some accidentally, accidental security risk. And the impact of this risk is that some data that shouldn't be seen can be accessed. So this is what we are talking about. OK, why do we care? Uh, I hear a lot saying, well, ISVs are the only one that need to care about security uh, because they have to go through a security review with Salesforce. And uh, you don't want your CRM, you don't want to have any apps that have any vulnerability. And that's why Salesforce is obviously extremely serious about that with ISVs. However, there is an, a, a similar mechanism for, for end users. So everyone is free to you know, do whatever they want with their orgs. And we see these problems a lot, right? Um, so why do we care? I mean, this is uh, maybe slightly off topic, but I believe, it's, I believe it isn't, right? But this is, so there is um, a World Economic Forum report of all the global risk uh, for this year. So this is, is basically a collection of all the risk that exists out there for humanity, and they are charted uh, by impact and likelihood, right? And uh, I mean, there is climate change that is uncontrolled. Uh, there are natural disasters. There is extreme winter, uh, extreme weather changes. Everything is like super scary. But there is also cyber attacks and data fraud and theft. And the point I'm trying to make is that with growing adoption of Salesforce, with more company, more and more companies transitioning to the cloud, more customer data, larger amount of data going into the cloud. This is something that us, as developers, as gatekeepers of the technical health of our customer orgs, we need to be serious about these things, right? And this is why we care. And we should care about these things. Now, these are the most common things we find. Uh, I gave you a little bit more. Uh, so the, the easy thing is sharing violations, like a lot of um, Code doesn't take sharing properly into account. Uh, this is technical. I, uh, uh, sorry for the non-developers here. Uh, but please be careful about this. Yeah? Now, Salesforce are doing a lot of good things about this with new, um, um, uh, new way to manage sharing programmatically that is inherently secure, uh, which is great. However, there is a legacy of like, code that was written before this. Right? So be careful about this. Keep this in mind. CRUD FLS violations, which is basically the risk that you have some, some fields are not accessible. You might have, I don't know, a salary information or a sensitive PI, personal PII type of data in, your, or in, your, in an object somewhere. And this information is, can be exposed with custom code, visual force. Um, now, there are many ways to open yourself to this type of vulnerability, but it's, it's quite common. It's surprisingly common. Um, SQL injection is another. Um, still, this is, this is a sneaky one. Um, so maybe ma many of you use a, a third-party library, a JavaScript, a jQuery thing for some custom page. You put it in a bundle. Uh, that's a zip file, no one looks at it ever again. But if that resource is vulnerable as a known vulnerability, that means that when your page loads, that vulnerability is carried across. And if that page is loaded in a, 
uh, let's say, portal in a community that is serious, right? But it's a very, very tricky thing to catch um, and, and still quite relevant. And so this is, this is just a snapshot of it. Uh, how much time do we have left? Five minutes. Uh, oh, sorry about that. I, I'll do it very quickly. The last thing is that I believe that as an ecosystem, we have a lot of work to do to become better developers and architects. Uh, it's not something that we do you know, from one day to the other. Uh, but the first thing is to recognize and acknowledge that there is something that isn't discussed enough. Um, I try to do a little bit of an exercise. I really like the, the report of the risk. So I thought, why don't we do the same with the Salesforce ecosystem, like with the code base that we, we, we scanned? So I came up with this model where on one axis we have how prone your code is to security problems. And the idea here is that, of course, some, so, sometimes we, we analyze like 5 million slides of code. Sometimes we, we, we analyze 5,000, right? So to make things comparable, we look at the density of problems. So how many problems per line of code? Yeah? So we can plot them on, a, on the same chart. So, and here we do the quality. So let's ask ourselves, is there any correlation between these two things? So here, let's start with the, secu with, with the, with the quality. Here, uh, you have people that write very secure code, very high quality. We call them the polar stars, right? So this is like the example that we should all follow. And then we have uh, the poor quality, high security. I couldn't really think how can you possibly do this intentionally. So I thought maybe, you know, it's just people that it's in a rush, it, like it's git push, git deploy. But they got lucky, in a way. <laughs> I don't know. I just came up with a name. Sorry, it's a bit silly. Uh, then you have um, the insecure code with like high quality. And I think this is like where you have all those people that are all about the beauty of the code and how it should look like and feel incredibly clean and everything. But there is no substance to it, right? And I know a couple of people <laughs> like this. Um, but it's. Um, it, 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 it's, just, it's just a category for, for, you know, for this matrix. And then here you have you know, the poor quality insecure. This is, this is a deployment on Fridays uh, before the weekend uh, uh, at 5 p.m. and uh, without like tweaking the, the test and everything. And uh, I just, I mean, it, it's just a silly exercise, but I just wanted to show you how can we plot all the 600 the points, uh, how does it work? I mean, wh what happens? And this is the result, okay? So, I mean, it's okay, as long as we acknowledge that there is something that we need to do about this, right? There is a, a still a clustering of deployments out there that have problems about security, about quality, so this is luckily not, not, not a thing, <laughs> which is good. So there are not many narcissistic people about the code in the ecosystem. Uh, but this is not about people. This is about our processes. It's about uh, we as professional, how do we deal with this type of teams, right? So I just wanted to give you uh, this picture. OK, let's see some takeaways. Um, so. A lot of implementation out there are affected by poor implementation quality. Uh, this is not a problem of uh, you know, aesthetics. It's a problem of cost of change. Uh, but quality is detrimental to the investment of any say, any, anyone that invests in Salesforce. Um, a bad implementation that grows becomes very expensive, like a, a kind of an elephant to evolve and maintain. Right. So if you are in this situation, please do something about it like on Monday when you go back to work. At least talk with your team, right? And uh, the more data we have in the cloud and the more customizations we have, this means that we are open more to security risk. Please don't underestimate this, right? This is important, this is serious, and is largely overlooked by everyone, as far as I can tell. Uh, thank you for your attention, and that's it. If you have any questions, we have to answer. Okay, no questions? Good? Oh. Maybe, uh, 
how do you determine um, what is the code uh, violation, for example? What is a code violation? Crude. A crude violation. OK, so a crude violation are uh, basically there is a certain pattern that needs to, um, so uh, this is something that depends from your view controller and data at the same time. You need to have some data that uh, needs to be sensitive to some degree. So that's defined in the metadata description of the file. Then you need to have uh, a view that uh, typically in Visual Force on Aura that uh, fetches that in a non-safe non way. So uh, there are certain ways in visual, let's take the visual for example. We, we look at many scenarios, but the, the visual for example is the easiest one. There are some tags that take care of this for you, but if you, call, if you have an expression in your visual force that calls a method and this method does a query, you're basically open to that risk. And what we do is we have built an engine that can traverse the code, understand the relationship of uh, views, controllers, and data, and pretty much figure out when that happens, right? And plus, we have a way to report, report false positives, so we clear them out of the data. Right, so there will still be maybe a little bit of error, like a one, two percent, that, that is a possibility. Uh, but we try to, you know, be as accurate as possible. Did I answer, answer your question? Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Good Let's say you have a null with the, the limit of character on six million characters, uh, 10 years old. A lot, a lot of code, bad code, what do you do? Well, the first thing that you should be doing is to understand the impact of the problem. So you should do an assessment, and uh, the assessment should outline the size of the problem and the impact of it, and give you a sense of what are the areas that should be tackled first, and lay out a plan of attack. And typically, what I suggest is to find the problems that are at the intersection between high impact and low complexity to fix. Those are the quick wins. Okay, so Sorry, you have to. Well, I, I, well. My customer is aware of the subject, but doesn't want to treat it. So we have to, to deal with it every day. Well, I, I believe that the best thing you can do is to educate them, get them to come to Dreamforce, get them to come to event, share my blog post. Um, no, but I will use this. The 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 thing is that, I mean, if you don't. If you believe you don't care, you probably don't understand the problem. Um, there, is, there is an impact that can be demonstrated, quantified. Uh, this is not abstract stuff. And the difficult thing to sell this is to explain, to do the education behind that. But uh, the, the plan should be assess, understand the impact, and see what are the quick wins. The first thing that should be assessed, and then so short-term solution and long-term solution should be fix this in, in your process. So make sure that every, um, every incremental change, every deployment goes through some sort of automated validation. Sorry. Um, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I will be up there. And if you want to have a chat, thank you.